Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. As uh, we come together, if you wouldn't mind joining me. Father in heaven, I pray that you would, you would truly bless our dear brother Mike with the right person to fill in his those big shoes to step into over there in that fellowship. But just give him the right one that has a heart for, for your sheep, to feed them and to love them. Lord, as we were mentored to do by Pastor Chuck, I pray that we could be used to continue to show your love to those you bring across our path. And Lord, we just pray that today you give us all ears to hear the, great, the greatness that you demonstrated in fulfilling your promises as we look at the birth of your son, the promise of his coming, even to be born of a virgin through Mary. We just pray, Lord, you just give us eyes to see and ears to hear what your spirit wants us to see and hear today, that we could grow in our faith, we ask it now in Jesus' name. And everyone that agree with me said? Amen. Amen. Would you turn with me to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 1? Now, in the scriptures, there's two places where we have the record of Jesus' birth of, um, from his youth. There's only two spots, the Gospel of Matthew, the first book of your New Testament, and the Gospel of Luke. And they're very interesting because the Gospel of Matthew, of course, starts off with the genealogy of Jesus telling us the promise that God gave from all the way, the, 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 the promise of the Messiah, the Redeemer. It wasn't a new thing, guys. As soon as Adam sinned, God said, don't worry, through your seed will come the one that will save. Okay? Your, your job is be fruitful and multiply, and I already got this worked out. Now, you can't, if you're not God, you might not think an infinite thought, so that might trip you out that God already foreknew this, but can God see into the future? Amen, right? It's not a trouble to him. So he saw all the generations to come and he was able to make the promise of the coming of the one that would redeem man out of the sin. And we studied it in Hebrews when we looked at how through one man, Adam, sin entered the world and yet through one man, the son of man, is his title, Jesus, that life would come through redemption because he would forgive sin. And so we would be able to have eternal life because of the second Adam. That's what the author of Hebrews calls him, the second Adam, Jesus. Now, Matthew is a Jewish fellow. Some folks don't know this. He was Jewish. He was, what, what was his occupation? Anyone remember? Tax collector. And yet Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, is one of these books of the Bible that you might see this phrase repeated. Well, if you read it, you, and you're a student of the Word, you definitely will. He always says, in order that the word of the Lord would be fulfilled, or that the prophecy would be fulfilled, or that this would be fulfilled. He was pointing out to the Jewish people their very promises that were given to them. And all he was doing was saying, hey, this is the relevant stuff going on today, but God said that that was going to go on, because God already foreknows. And so he already foretold this happening, and we're just letting you know that it was fulfilled. Now, why is that important that, that we start off the very New Testament with a whole book of completed fulfillments of promises that God made? What does that do for your faith, by the way, if you look at God pr making a promise and then bringing it to pass, and then making another promise and bringing it to pass? And I don't know about you, but for me, validates, validates it, doesn't it? It helps. It, it makes it like, this is, this is really cool. This is something that he foreknew and he foresaid so that, well, the scripture says in Ezekiel that God says, I will tell you before it comes to pass so that when it comes to pass, you will know one thing. What is that one thing we would know? That he is the Lord. That he is God. You know, God doesn't mind showing us that he's God. This is one of those things, you know, you might have someone come up to you and say, well, if God's really real, why doesn't he just show himself? And that's a, that's a valid question. But I have a good answer. You know what it is, right? He did. He already did. He showed himself in his son. In fact, his disciples, Jesus' disciples said to him, just show us the Father, it will suffice. And he said, have I been with you so long a time 
If you've seen me, what do you say? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Don't worry. I already got this down. But see, it is a question in men's hearts. If God is real, why doesn't he show himself? And the answer is, we get the, we get the great privilege as Christians to declare he did. He did show himself. In fact, next week, I'll show you that he's going to, he's going to proclaim the angels when Jesus is born will, will proclaim Emmanuel. Do you guys know what Emmanuel means? God what? With us. I mean, that's a proclamation the angels made just to make sure we don't mess it up. You know, let, let's get this one fact perfectly clear. God did come to be with us in his son. Well, before the birth of his son, he also pro made some promises, some really peculiar ones. I mean, signs that I don't think I would have come up with these signs. But God goes, let me just show off a little. Because he, he, he kind of like, have you noticed how God stacks all the odds against him and then he pulls it off? And everyone goes, it's a miracle. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, when you're God, miracles are like no problem. You can do miracles easy. But see, I believe that those things are done so our faith can be strengthened. We can see the miraculous hand of our God and we can go, yeah, I, I really appreciate that he did that. Just helps my faith a little. Gives me a little boost. Because, you know, when, like Aaron went over last week, he kind of gave me the whole prelude talking about the birth of, of the forerunner of the Messiah, John, who he named his little boy John after. And this this gracious gift of God, this, this one that was given, told that the one that comes after me, I'm not worthy to untie his sandal. Not even the thong of his sandal, but he's the one who will redeem man. He will pay for our sins. That's the Messiah. He's coming. And God did some pretty cool things to make sure that even Zacharias, his father, John's father, knew that his boy had a special anointing to be the forerunner to the Christ. And that that promise of the Messiah was, was really close. I mean, if you were Zacharias, can you imagine how excited you'd be knowing that your boy, an angel told you that your boy would be the one, that voice crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. Get ready, here comes the Lord. I mean, this is something the Jews have been waiting for this fulfillment of this promise, well, since Adam. Since Adam and Eve first sinned in the garden, God said, I'll send a redeemer through your seed. But then God didn't just tell the promise to Adam. In fact, look with me at Matthew chapter 1. You'll see the record of the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah. The son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham, he says, was the father of Isaac. Isaac, the father of Jacob. Jacob, the father of Judah and his brothers. And Judah was the father of Perez and then Zerah by Tamar. Perez was the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Ram. Ram was the father of Aminadab. Aminadab was the father of Nashon. Nashon the father of Solomon. Solomon the father of Boaz by Rahab. Remember Boaz and Rahab? Boaz was the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed was the father of Jesse. Jesse was the father of who? You guys know David. Now David was the father of Solomon by Bathsheba who had been the wife of Uriah. Solomon was the father of Rehoboam. Rehoboam was the father of Abijah. Abijah, the father of Asa. Asa was the father of Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat, the father of Joram. Joram, the father of Uzziah. Uzziah, the father of Jotham. Jotham, the father of Ahaz. And Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah. Now, I'm going to stop right here because Ahaz, I just want you to notice this name. This is, um, anyone know about this king, Ahaz? And Hezekiah, were they anybody in the Bible? Ahaz was a very upright king. We read about him in the, in the book of Kings and Chronicles. Uh, a man that was, well, he was a friend, but he had a prophet that was his friend, a guy named Isaiah. I only key in on this because, you know, his nickname was the same as mine, Is. I'm pretty sure they called him Is, but anyway, he was a friend uh, of this king, and I only point this out because Ahaz was the king of Judah at the time. This, the kingdoms of Israel were separated around 700 BC. And they had the northern kingdom that, that was called prop by proper Israel, the, the northern ten tribes, we say. It's really nine and a half and two and a half in the south, but we'll just round off for easy ten and two. And the southern kingdom's called Judah, 
where Jerusalem lays. And the king, the right upright king at that time was Ahaz. God said some nice things about him because of his heart being right towards God. And he had the, pro he didn't mean everything went good for him. Ahaz had some major attacks against Israel while he was the king. Unfortunately, he'll be replaced, um, well, he'll, he'll get Hezekiah, and then Hezekiah will be a really, really good guy after God's heart. Unfortunately, the spawn of him, I wish they went to, but he's even in the genealogy of Jesus, Manasseh, the guy that caused the most evil, I mean, as far as a king of Israel, I can't believe he's in the genealogy of Jesus. Have you noticed the genealogy of Jesus doesn't have all perfect people? I mean, you got Tamar, you got Rahab. You know, I think Rahab was, what, what was her occupation? Yeah, yeah, a harlot, right? Yeah, she got in the genealogy of Jesus. And Manasseh, the most wicked king of Israel, this guy, he was horrible. Anyway, these guys make it into the genealogy. Then Ammon, the son of, he was the son of Manasseh. Then Josiah became the father of Jeconiah, his brother, at that time, there was the deportation to Babylon. God had been really patient, waiting for them to repent by the prophet Jeremiah for 40 years. They didn't listen. So they got carried away. That time, that, now we've caught up to where, where Daniel got carried away. Remember Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego? That's their Babylonian names. They get taken away. And then after the deportation to Babylon, there's Jeconiah. He becomes the father of Shittiel. Shittiel becomes the father of Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel was the father of Abahad, Abahad the father of Elikim, Elikim the father of Azor, Azor the father of Zo Z Zadok, Zadok the father of Achim, Achim the father of Eliad, Eliad the father of Eleazar, and Eleazar the father of Mathen. Mathen is the father of Jacob. Now Jacob was the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, by whom Jesus was born. By Mary, it says, Mary, by whom Jesus was born. It doesn't say that Jesus... See, this is the genealogy of Joseph. This is the patriarch genealogy of Joseph, the husband of Mary, by whom Jesus was born, who is called the Messiah. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations, from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations from the deportation to Babylon to the Messiah, 14 generations. Now, if you don't know Jewish culture, they always tried to like, for memory technique, group things in like groups of sevens or groups of 14, you know, like if you set up sets, it's a little easier in your mind to remember, oh, there's three sets of 14. Or because they're taught seven is the complete number, they, it, it's just something, you know, seven days to a week, seven natural notes to a, to, to a scale on the piano, then you come to the octave, the eighth note, you start over again. So every seven is a complete set. Two sevens is 14. So he's just saying two sevens, two sevens, two sevens. Now if you're Jewish, this is only to help the mind remember. How many generations did it take? Well, six sevens. Until the God made a promise and he fulfilled the promise six sevens later. Six times seven generations later. It's just like, you know, the mind. We, we, we need stuff to help us remember this stuff. So if you remember three fourteens easier or, or six sevens, either way, that's just to help you remember how long till God fulfilled his promise. Now, this is the genealogy of Joseph, the husband of Mary. Who's Matthew writing to? Jews or Gentiles, you think? Jews. His whole gospel is slanted to the Jews. All the fulfillments, all the words God spoke concerning his promises to the Jews. When we look at the other gospel that tells us about the birth of Jesus, anyone know which gospel that is? Someone said it. Luke. And Luke wrote his letter to a guy named the most excellent Theophilus. Theophilus, Theo in Greek is what? God. And Phyllis is what? Lover. Lover of God. This guy, most excellent, that was his title. He says, oh, I have carefully examined all the history, all the details. But was Luke a Jew? or uh, Is that a Jewish name, by the way, Luke? No. 
What was Luke's occupation? Some of you already know this, but he's a doctor, a physician. And he, he took great pains to do his research to find out all the details about the goings-on of, of this whole thing about the Messiah. But he's, a, he's taking it from the Gentile perspective. Does he really care about the patriarchal fulfillment of the, the promise through the genealogy? Why, why do I need a genealogy to prove who the Messiah came through? He didn't really, he, you know. But he found out that it was kind of important to the culture. So, but he does it with a different slant. Some people didn't know this. They, they will ask me, why do they read different in the genealogy of, of Matthew to come to Jesus and the genealogy in Luke to come to Jesus? Does anyone know the answer to that? It's really simple. It's Mary's genealogy because Luke's like, hey, man, Joseph wasn't technically the father. He did his research. Who was the father? God. It was Mary, the mother, so he thought that was pretty important. You ought to trace down to her. You can prove her genealogy. And she is Jewish, by the way. And was it a promise to the Jewish women that they would be preserved through childbirth? God had made that promise from the beginning. So this was a great honor. In fact, this was an honor that the women of Israel, if they didn't have a child, remember when Sarah didn't have a child? And she said, oh man, I'm a failure. I can't even, I mean, how am I going to be part of the whole Fulfilling of the promises of God. If I don't have any children, you know, and it was a, it was a, it was a big deal. You know, we'll look at next week how Mary is. She, she's just exuberant that God had blessed her to have a child. But today we're going to look at the story just a little bit back, when the promise of this child comes, and it comes at a time when Mary and Joseph are betrothed. Betrothed is what we call serious engagement. Okay, betrothed is not just being engaged. In the betrothal period in Israel, it's a little different than our engagement period. In fact, it's uh, usually about a year season, all four seasons of the year, usually lasts at least that long. So when you're serious about a, a gal, guys, you had, to, you had to save up money for a thing called a dowry. You had to pay the parents and say, look, this is a gift to you for your daughter. And it's to show that I'm really sincere about wanting her hand in marriage. And I'm so willing to take care of her that, in fact, during this period for a year, just to show you I'm willing, guess what they had to do? They had to pay the father all the bills that it would cost to take care of the daughter. Can you imagine if we did this today in our courtship? You're really serious? All right, start paying. Pay me for a year. Show me that you can support her. Now, this is what was required in the betrothal period in the Jewish culture. Some folks don't know their, you know, cultural heritage, the stuff that, you know, Hawaiians have different things that they have rules about when, when, when it comes time for marriage, some of the things that they, res especially if you were in the ali'i, the king, you know, lineage. Did they just give away their daughter? Free? No, did they? Angie, did they? No. They did not. And they did not in Israel either. It was a serious thing. Joseph was betrothed. Oh, but I forgot to tell you, you get to pay to take care of her. She lives under her parents' roof. You, sp you pay all the bills for her, her being there. And there's no touchy-touchy. <laughs> this is not a, one of those relationships with benefit kind of thing. This is, you're just showing you're sincere about wanting her. And so... We read in Matthew's Gospel something very interesting about this betrothal period. That Joseph and Mary are engaged. He's actually having to support her to, to, to her parents. And we read in verse 18, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as followed. His mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph. Before they came together, that means before they consummated their relationship, we have children present, so... You guys know what that means. Before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, he planned to send her away secretly. Now, in the Jewish culture, I, I, just a quick question. If you're Joseph, do you know whether you've 
had relations with Mary? Yes. And you find out that she's with child during your betrothal period. What do you, as a man, naturally think? I know what my son would say, because he hangs, there's some boys that worry. She wasn't, I, I can't say that on tape, so I'll just, you know. She was not faithful. I mean, that's the natural mind. I know, that's what I would think, you know, if you're engaged and you know you didn't have relations with your future bride and all of a sudden she says, I'm pregnant, I'm with child. You'd be like, somebody's been fooling around here. And Jewish culture said that if that did happen, what was the penalty for the girl? Death. According to the law, she was to be stoned to death, taken out in front of the elders and stoned. I mean, this is, this is a big deal. Yet Joseph, it said, being a righteous man, there was something in him that said, it's not right to stone her to death. He could have. He could have pulled, pulled the trump card and said, you know, she's been unfaithful. I know I didn't sleep with her. And she's with child. So, um, but it says here, verse 20, but when he considered putting her away secretly, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. And he said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bear a son, and you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now all of this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall be with child, shall bear a son. They shall call his name Emmanuel, which translates what? God with us. Now, where does it say this verse? Does anyone know? You might have cross-references. Look in your notes there. See if you spot it. Isaiah what? Isaiah 7. That's right. Look with me at Isaiah 7. I want to show you. This is in the time of that king I was just telling you about, Ahaz. Ahaz actually had a bit of a problem in his reign, the... The Syrians, or today we call the place uh, Armenia, Armenians, had come against Israel, the southern kingdom. They were coming to attack. Now, the Syrians were not known as being nice guys. I mean, they were really hostile. Nothing's changed, by the way, toward Israel. Still are. It's amazing that the descendants of these people are still against Israel. But it says that they came against Ahaz in these days, and it was it was a it was discouraging to Ahaz. In chapter seven, verse three of Isaiah, it says, "Then the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out and meet Ahaz, you and and your son Sheer Sheer Jaz Jaz Up." He says, "You guys go, you and your boy, and and." at the end of the conduit of the upper pool on the highway that's there by the fuller's field, and say to him, take care and be calm, and, and have no fear. Don't be faint-hearted because of these two stubs of smoldering firebrands on account of the fierce anger of Rezin and Aram, the son of Remaliah. Because of Aram with, with Ephraim and the sons of Remaliah, they have planned evil against you, saying, let us go up against Judah and terrorize it. Let us make ourselves a breach in it, in its walls, and set up the son of Tabiel, the king, as king in the midst of it. They're going to... You know, the Lord knew what was going on. He says, and he sends Isaiah, he says, don't be afraid just because these guys are plotting to, to make a breach in your wall and take you and overthrow you and set up this other guy, Tabiel, as king. Now, if you're the king, you might be a little concerned, especially when you've got a really bad, mean army coming against you. But the, the Lord had the prophet speak to Ahaz and says, it, this plan will not stand and it will not come to pass. And the head of Aram is Damascus and the head of Damascus is, is Rezin. Now within 65 years, Ephraim will be shattered so that it will no longer be a people. And the head of Ephraim is Samaria and the head of Samaria is the son of Remaliah. And, and if you will not believe, you, you surely shall not last. 
Isaiah is saying, you just got to trust the Lord here. Because if you don't believe him, it's not, you're not going to last. But God's got this under control. Then the Lord spoke again to Ahaz, saying, Ahaz, ask yourself a sign. Having a little rough day? Go ahead, ask me a sign. Make whatever you want. Make as high as, it says, as deep as Sheol or as high as the heavens. You can pick any sign. Now, how would you like God to say that to you? Having a bad faith day? Just pick a sign, any sign. I'll do it for you. Anyone think this would be kind of nice for your day? Like, hey, Lord, that's good, man. Could you, uh, I could figure out a sign. Like, could you, like, pay off all my bills in the house and fill my bank account? To, I mean, you want a sign? Hey, okay, that'll, I'll give you, right? I can come up with something, I'm pretty sure. Fix your back. Fix our body, right? Make me stub my toe on a 60-ton piece of gold or something in my driveway. Belongs to me. <laughs> Right? I, I, I can come up with something. Need a sign, right? Ahaz, Ahaz, this king, listen to this. Ahaz says in verse 12, I will not ask, nor will I test the Lord. Nope. And then he said, listen now, O house of David. Is it too slight a thing for you to try the patience of men? that you also try the patience of my God as well. Isaiah is the one speaking for the Lord here. He says, therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, here's the sign the Lord will give. A virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. You want a sign? God goes, I'm going to pick one. But see, I'm thinking gold in my bank account or my body made well, and God goes, no, I'm going to show off. How many virgins pop up pregnant? Doesn't work that way, does it? But God goes, I want you to know for certain it's me. So he didn't leave this to chance. We don't have any record of any other virgins popping up with a baby that was inseminated by the overshadowing of God's spirit. I mean, this is... This is the sign of signs. It's the opening to the New Testament. I mean, this was promised 700, about 725 B.C. The Lord made this promise to the king of Judah, saying, I'll pick the sign, just so you know I'm going to do this. Now, by the way, did God take care of the enemies? Those of you students of the scripture, you know, did he take care of these two fellows that were coming against the, the, the southern king of Judah? Yes. Just, just within 65 years, they're both wiped out. Just as the Spirit spoke. Because God already knew. But God knew something even better that was going to happen 700 years later. Now, to us, that's a long time. But remember, the Scripture says, to the Lord, a day is as a what? thousand years. And a thousand years as a day. This is even one day later in God's economy of time. He says, I got a better sign. I'm going to trump it with a better sign. I'm going to make a version to be with child so you know, and, and the child's name is what? Really important. Emmanuel, which means God with us. Did God want us to know that he would be with us? Did God make a promise that he repeated over and over so that we would know he would be with us? I mean, the, you know, we read in the Psalm 23 that, that I'll fear no evil for thou art what? With me. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Remember that one? He leads me by the green pastures. He restores my soul. But he's the one that says, Jesus said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'm the good shepherd. But that promise of that coming shepherd was made to the king of Israel when he was offered, pick any sign you want. And he went, I ain't picking nothing. I'm not testing God. God goes, all right, let me pick the sign. Now you think about this one. Let me pick the sign. He picks a crazy one. I mean, to, to my natural mind, this is like cuckoo. Pick, okay, out of all the signs you're going to pick, I'm going to pick a virgin's going to be with child. Oh, by the way, the child that she's going to be with is going to be God with us. So it's going to be the, it's going to be the son of God. Pick a sign. Wow, what a good sign. 
And Joseph, listen to this. I mean, Joseph was considering putting her away secretly because she's with child. And, and this is how he finds out who's the father. Now, this is a good way to find out because if someone else told me the story, I wouldn't believe it. I mean, I don't know if you were, put yourself in Joseph's shoes, guys, for a minute. You find out the girl you're betrothed to is with child, and you know maybe you kissed her, but you know kissing doesn't make the baby. I mean, when I was little, they used to tell us, "Be careful, don't kiss; you might make a baby." That was like a wives' tale, you know. The the old Italian women would tell the like. I was thinking my nona would be pregnant a million times. We all kiss her, right? I mean, like. As a kid, you're thinking, uh, you don't have the, the best logic thought. You're like, but we kiss Nana all the time. It's like, you know, she would have millions of babies. That's not what makes the baby. And Joseph knew, and he was, he, if I put myself in his shoes, I would need an angel of the Lord to tell me this. And he's got to be really a real angel, not one of them precious moments, little pastel thing, you know, like, I'm here for God. And be like, I don't trust you. Uh uh. This has got to be a real angel. And a real angel says to him, Don't worry, this is what God spoke. Now, Matthew, of course, he says in verse 22, Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. The fulfillment of what God has spoken. How important is it for us to hear that God spoke and then he fulfilled what he spoke? It's something about the way we're wired. We need to like, just a, it's, a, it's a part of our faith. We need constant remi reminding that God, when he makes a promise, he keeps it. And there's nothing, like Aaron went over the birth of, uh, uh, of John and then j he just jumped ahead just to preview what we're going to go over a portion of next week about how when we look at this same story in the Gospel of Luke, Mary finds out that she's with child. And guess what? She knows she didn't do anything with Joseph. And she knows she hasn't been with any man. And when the angel says to her, you're going to be with child, she goes, how can this be since I am a what? A virgin. She has the same question. Like, how can it be? Now, if you, if you put together, which one, who got the visit from the angel first, Mary or Joseph? Mary did. Had to. Mary got the visit before she was with child. Joseph got the visit after she was with child. I'm just putting it together for you so you, you know, chronological thinkers, they like everything in the story. Who got the first visit? Well, Mary did. Mary got the visit from the angel before she was pregnant. And she said, how can this be? And, and the angel of the Lord told her, that the, the Spirit of the Most High, God's Holy Spirit, will overshadow you. He'll be the one that causes you to be a child. Now, to some people, they go, this is such a silly story, God making a girl pray. I, can't, I don't even think it can happen. I'm like, jeepers, you have like no faith at all. I mean, how hard is this on a scale for God to do? I mean, we, have, we can now mechanically do artificial insemination, which is, you know, we can have the girl to be with child without having the act of sex, but it's not the same as with the story we're reading here. There was no artificial, this is God just said, you're with child. You're with child, and this child, he already knew the sex before the sex was born. It's going to be a boy. And he's the one who's going to redeem Israel. And when we read about the story, you know, he says, Behold, you'll conceive in your womb. I'm sorry, I jumped over to Luke chapter 1. It's <coughs> today's studies, Matthew 1 and Luke 1. Next week will be Matthew 2, Luke 2. Just for ease. A little bit of 3 of Luke 3, just one little tidbit in there I want to tie in. But, but in verse 31 of Luke 1, he says, And the angel said, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and name, his name shall be... What? Jesus. Now that's the English for his name. His name is Yahshua in Hebrew. Yahshua, that's correct. We, it's, it's really Yehovah Shua, contracted. We don't say the whole name of the Lord Yehovah. We say Yah for just a, 
contraction form. And then Shua, so it's the name of the Lord, God's name, saves. Shua means saves. God saves. Literally, he goes up to Jesus when he's in grade school. What's your name? Yeshua. God saves. It literally translates more God's salvation. J just to be clear, literally, his, how'd you like to be named this? What's your name? God's salvation. No, come on, quit clowning around. What's really your name? God's salvation. You know, the one who brings salvation by God to everyone. That's my name. It's real cryptic, isn't it? Really a hard one to find out who this guy is. And it says, and he will be great. He will be called the son of the most high and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever and his kingdom will have no end. This is what the angel told Mary. Now she's not even pregnant yet. Mary says to the angel, how can this be since I'm a virgin? Verse 34. Luke 1, 35, she says, and the angel answered her and said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for this reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. And behold, even now your relative Elizabeth has also conceived in her old age, and she who was called barren is now in her sixth month. For nothing this is what Aaron ended his sermon with last week. Nothing is what? Impossible with God. I love this. Nothing is impossible with God. This, this isn't, how hard is it for God to do this? No, nothing. Well, since nothing's impossible for him, this doesn't even fall into the hard to do category. Hard. Nothing's hard. I mean, it just doesn't really freak him out. And we re jump back to Matthew chapter 1, and Joseph, it says, woke from his dream, and he did as the Lord commanded him, and he took Mary as his wife. And verse 25 tells us something really neat. But he kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. He did not have relations with her until after Jesus was born. After Jesus was born, some people... Now, I was raised Catholic. We were taught the perpetual virginity of Mary. That's not really scriptural. It says he kept her a virgin until Jesus was born. And it's very interesting. In the same Gospel of Matthew... Can I just show you something for those of you... In case you run into this, you might run into someone like that was raised like I was taught. I mean, I went to Catholic school, learned Latin, learned to do the Mass in Latin. And then I find out that you know, I thought Jesus was his, an only child. I was always jealous. I'm the oldest of six. I was like, man, he can't relate. You know those only ch children, they get everything. When you're in a big family, you got to share and hand-me-downs. And I was actually smaller than my younger brother. So I got hand-me-ups. I was a dis like really stinger. And then I'm reading the Gospel of Matthew, and it says in, in chapter 12, at the end of chapter 12, it says in verse 46, and while Jesus was speaking to the crowds, behold, his mother and his brothers were standing outside seeking to speak to him. Mothers and what? Brothers. And someone said to him, behold, your mother and your brothers are standing outside seeking to speak to you. But Jesus answered and said, the, the one <clears throat> who was telling him, he said, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And stretching out his hand toward his disciples, he said, behold, my mother and my brothers, for whoever does the will of my Father who is in heaven, he is my brother and sister and mother. So you think, oh, he's just referring to these people. That's how I was taught in the Catholic Church. Look, behold, all my mothers and brothers and sisters. Flip the page to the next chapter, chapter 13. And just notice at the end of chapter 13, it says... And Jesus, in verse 53, when he had finished these parables, he departed from there, and he came to his hometown.